Welcome to PTSD 911 Presents. This is a podcast for first responders and those who support first responders. And on this show, we talk about mental health and wellness. And our goal is to have deep conversations that inspire and motivate first responders to take care of themselves and their peers when it comes to their mental health. Hi, my name is Conrad Weaver. I'm your host, and I'm excited to bring you this program. And I'm excited to be working on a documentary film also called PTSD 911. And I'm so grateful that you stopped by to watch and to listen today. And if you're watching on YouTube, please let us know where you're watching from. And if you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button and leave us a review. We'd love to know what you think about the show and how we can improve the show. Jeff Dill founded the Firefighter Behavior Health Alliance, the FBHA, in 2011. He travels across the U.S. and Canada holding workshops to teach firefighters about behavior health awareness and suicide prevention. FBHA is the only known organization that collects and validates data on firefighter, EMT, and 911 dispatcher suicides across the U.S. In addition, FBHA holds classes for counselors or chaplains, family members, and those preparing for retirement. Jeff holds a master's degree in counseling and is a licensed professional counselor and a retired fire captain. And he's currently with the Las Vegas, the North Las Vegas Fire Department in Las Vegas, Nevada. Here's my conversation with Jeff Dill. Well, Jeff Dill, welcome to PTSD 911 Presents. I'm so glad you're able to join me today for the program. Thank you, Conrad. It's uh, both my pleasure and my honor to be on your podcast. So for the uninitiated and the people who don't know who you are, tell us who you are and what do you do? Well, uh, that's that could take a whole uh, a long time. There's a lot of things I've done in my life. <laughs> Uh, it, it is amazing, you know. When I when I graduated from high school from Rochester, New York, I, I just I didn't want to work at Kodak. I didn't want to work at Xerox. I wasn't an in office person, but I know I didn't want to go to college. And so mm-hmm. I moved to Chicago to live with my uncle, my dad's brother, and I met my bride there in '79. We got married in '80, and I was still I was kind of finding myself. I didn't know exactly. I had a full time job, so I, I took care of that aspect. I always had that with our two daughters being born in 82 and 84. I was just, I was searching. I'd done so many things. I was a broadcaster for a radio station. I used to cover the Bulls games and interview Michael Jordan. I uh, worked for a minor league ball club. And then it all changed when I built our house. My uh, father in law and I built our house in Gilberts, Illinois, when a neighbor walked over and said, Jeff, we're looking for some volunteer firefighters. Would you be interested? And I thought, well, hmm. I've tried everything else in my life. I might as well try this as well. <laughs> and I absolutely fell in love. I went through EMT paramedic, the academy, uh, some hazmat officer classes, moved up to a lieutenant fairly quickly. And then in 1995, a new fire department was founded, Palatine Rural Fire Protection District, just outside of in the northwest suburbs of Chicago. I thought, I'm 33 years old, I'll give it a shot. And I was fortunate to be one of the founding members of the department. And I moved up uh, pretty quickly within that organization. And yet my life took a turn uh, for the better when Hurricane Katrina hit. And it Mm -hmm. was unfortunate, uh, but Chicago Land sent down numerous firefighters from uh, the area, including a couple from our department. And when they came back, they said, Jeff, she's we, uh, we were picking up bodies in the streets. We saw devastation. It was horrific. And they needed to talk to someone about this. And like I said, this is you know, 2005. I'm a battalion chief at the time. And they went to their employee assistant program counselors. Good people, but they, they just didn't understand our world because, as you know, back then, sure. we never talked about behavioral health. Mm-hmm. And so uh, they never went back. And I thought, well, how can I give back to my brothers and sisters? I decided to go back at my master's degree, and I became a licensed counselor. And in 2009, I founded Counseling Services for Firefighters, where I was traveling, educating counselors and chaplains. Hey, you want to work with us? You need to understand this. We're a little different. Not that it's wrong from my point of view. We're a little different. When in 2010, I started receiving emails and phone calls from all over the world saying, do you do anything about firefighter suicides? And Mm. I'm thinking, geez, I've never heard of any issue like that. And called the United States Fire Administration, the NFF, the IFF, the IFC, the NFPA, the NVFC, NIOSH, OSHA. No one kept any data. 
So in 2010, my wife, Karen, and I, we founded Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance. And it was then that we started tracking and validating fire and EMS suicides. And uh, it has been one heck of a ride these last dozen years, uh, traveling over three quarters of a million miles across the U.S. and uh, speaking to our brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. That has to be a really uh, a challenging thing to be be doing is to, you know, documenting these or keeping track of them. How do you personally keep yourself in a healthy state of mind? I'm asked that question a lot. And I, I think no matter if it's this or whatever other business that you're in, it is a special calling and it is a special blessing uh, because out of the 1,746 um, suicides that we have validated, and it's only been me. I'm the only one at FBHA has ever seen the data. Uh, we, we stick uh, to strict uh, confidentiality. But I have personally spoken to over 1,700 chief officers or family members to uh, validate the data. So I, I, mm. I know I have to take care of myself. There, there's no doubt about it. Uh, first off, the good Lord is, is, is absolutely walking by my side. But there's mm. also, you know, there has to be that self-care and the ability. And, and I've noticed uh, in myself that at times I become a little closed off, even when, after I hear how some tragic event of our brother or sister who took their life. But it, it only lasts a certain time. And uh, my wife, who's an empath, she can't hear about it. She can't talk about it because she absorbs everything. So mm-hmm. it's, it's just a way of me releasing through either listening to music, exercising. And, of course, uh, I play a lot of pickleball. And anyone with the last mm-hmm. name Dill <laughs> plays a lot of pickleball. So, <laughs> you know, you, you find those outside sources that helps you just take everything away uh, from your mind. And, and I need that especially now because last July 1st, I started as the behavior health administrator for Las Vegas Fire and Rescue. So mm-hmm. I added more uh, into you know my mind. And I will tell you mm-hmm. one thing, I have started going to brain mapping therapy. And mm-hmm. uh, that has been just a wonderful release for me as well. Mm-hmm. Boy, the city of Las Vegas has had its share of tragedies, you know, over the years, and especially in the last few years. And thinking back to the the shooting that happened a few years ago, yeah. I'm sure there's probably still people there who are affected by that. Can you speak uh, to that in any way? No doubt. Uh, October 1st, uh, 2017 was a horrific day, uh, the Mandalay Bay shooting. And yes, uh, there were many of uh, the first responders in this area that were at that concert, many that were injured by gunshots, uh, those who that responded. It was in the, the city of Las Vegas, but in uh, Clark County Fire District. So in the downtown Las Vegas and the outskirts to the north and west and east is the city of Las Vegas Fire Department. But either way, they were both they were both there and responding to just a horrific scene. And yes, they, they still struggle. So it was always my intent uh, when I got here is to uh, not able to not only to talk to them, but also find those resources. And it's mm-hmm. absolutely important that we provide resources for our brothers and sisters, just like every organization should be able to uh, continue with uh, updating their resources, finding new resources, resources for their people. I know it's probably been talked about over and over again, you know, with a lot of people in leadership in the fire service and in other places. But what do you think, you know, why were people in the past re- resistant to really even talking about mental health and wellness in the fire service? Well, I call it uh, cultural brainwashing. And what that means to me is that every time we put this uniform on, we are expected to act in a certain matter, whether it's strong, brave, courageous, give help, don't ask for help. We handle all things on our own. I don't want to be the weak link of the company. And when you're struggling with your personal professional issues, and to go those things alone is, is very difficult. So cultural brainwashing played a major role within the, especially the fire and EMS world and, and police, but uh, we'll stick to the culture that I'm uh, familiar with. And, and so cultural brainwashing played a really major role and because we're expected to act this way. And who expects us? Well, our brothers and sisters we work with, the communities we serve, and the traditions of the fire and EMS service said, hey, this is how you are supposed to act. 
And uh, if you're not acting this way, then maybe you need to get out. And, and you, you used to hear that all the time. Hey, if you, if you can't handle this job, you can't stand the sight of death or blood, well, then guess what? You, you shouldn't be in this job. And, and so we, we mocked and ridiculed. And even today, that is still uh, some part of a practice that occurs because within our data, we have numerous fire and EMS that have taken their lives because of harassment. And I'm not talking se- sexual. I'm talking a bullying type of harassment. Mm. Mm. So, so how does an agency overcome that? Well, first off, it, it's... It, You have to have buy-in from the top, but you also have to have Mm. buy-in all the way from the academy to the top. And Mm. so one of the things that FBHA does is we help create behavior health programs for organizations. Just having an employee system program or a peer support team just doesn't cut it anymore. There has to be so much more. For us, it's, it's 12 points. Means that every organization needs to start training in the academies. We need to start educating the families training our officers on how to listen and provide resources, work with peer support team or SISM teams, whichever your organization uses, train chaplains because volunteers, departments, they really rely on on chaplains. So, and then you have to start developing guidelines and policies. And this is important to have guidelines and policies on behavioral health. In my travels, I estimate probably less than five to 8% of all organizations have a behavior health guidelines and policies. Those that Mm. tell you what to do, how to look for resources, what happens in this situation. And and they're not there for management. They're there for everyone to understand, if I ask for help, what's going to happen? What are the steps? And it goes all the way to point number 12, which is retirement. How are we preparing Mm. our people for retirement? Instead of just an ax on a board and a party and say, thanks Mm. uh, for all your time, because you know, we, we develop our workshops based on our data. And I started seeing in our retirees out of the 297 that we have validated, 37 of them took their lives within the first week of retirement. Wow. So we started, we started interviewing retirees and found out very quickly that loss of identity, loss of belonging, and lack of purpose were the main drives. And, and it's, Typical within a fire organization or EMS organization, when you first start, they hand you all the paperwork for your retirement. This is your pension. If you put this much in, this and this and that, well, 20 years goes by in a heartbeat. And all of a sudden, Mm -hmm. well, I'm I'm financially, if I work 20, 25, 30 years, I know to a nickel what I'm going to get. Yet we forget Mm -hmm. about the emotional impact of ending this career, which, like I said, it happened in a heartbeat. Kind of looking kind of closer at the current situation, uh, what are the numbers this year? Do you have some data on that as to, you know, firefighter suicides? Do you have that information that you can update us on? Yes. Uh, for 2022, I have a total of 29, which is 26 firefighters and three EMS. I still have five to validate that have happened uh, recently. Uh, just last week, unfortunately, I had to validate seven losses. And, uh, you know, wow. people think about it, wow, seven across the United States. And that's only what we estimate. We estimate about a 65% mm-hmm. reporting because we track career, volunteer, military firefighters, as well as wildland, EMS, mm-hmm. and dispatchers. In 2019, we mm-hmm. started tracking uh, our comp specs um, specialist. So, mm-hmm. you know, we, we know that there's... You know, approximately 1.1 million firefighters and 70% are career, or excuse me, are volunteer. So we know that we're missing uh, numbers. And um, mm-hmm. we, we always, our intent was that we want to remember our brothers and sisters. We want to understand why they're taking their lives as well as uh, to, uh, don't forget about the family members, the, the survivors. Mm-hmm. And so when mm-hmm. we founded FBHA, my wife and I, it was educational workshops, a scholarship program for children, a fire and EMS and dispatchers, as well as an annual weekend retreat for family survivors. And uh, on that, during that weekend retreat, we hold what we call We Remember Night. It's a national event, and uh, this will be our eighth year for this. It happens on May 20th. We ask... Um, at 2100 hours local time 
departments, organizations, or if you're in dispatch, do stand outside with a candle. But for the fire and EMS, pull your rigs out, run your lights for one minute to symbolize that we remember our, our brothers and sisters, their voices that have gone silent. And so we have organizations all across the U.S. and Canada that uh, are involved in this We Remember Night. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important, especially for those families who, because typically if someone, I know in law enforcement, it's, it's like this, if you, you know, you know, lose your life by suicide, you typically don't get any benefits and the family's kind of left in a lurch. Right. Uh, it. Uh, there's uh, there's been a change. I know one place in Texas, there was a law enforcement suicide this past year, and and the chief said this is line of duty, and they made you know gave this guy all everything that he deserved and his family as well. But that's extremely rare, and I'm sure it's probably similar in the fire service. Yeah, the uh, the, the big change came with the uh, new laws on PTSD. So if mm -hmm. we have a firefighter or EMS personnel that has died by suicide that's related to PTSD, the IFF does recognize that, and the member does get their benefits, as well as a name on the wall in Colorado Springs for the IFF. As for mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, we remember the rest of them. Uh, the NFF, mm -hmm. uh, in all its great work, uh, they still don't recognize suicide, so there's nothing on the wall mm -hmm. there in, in Emmitsburg, which is fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's separation. There's there's honor in that wall as, as well for line of duty deaths. But, uh, you know, like I said, there is also honor in those that struggled for all these years with PTSD. And so remembering mm -hmm. the families is, is absolutely vital. Uh, unfortunately, uh, due to COVID, we were not able to hold our eighth annual weekend retreat for family survivors because, you know, it, it's difficult it is, Conrad, uh, we don't get a lot of funding because it's suicide and behavioral health, mm. yeah, which is uh, pretty amazing. I've had major fire manufacturers tell me to my face, Jeff, we love what you do, but it's, it's suicide and that's a negative connotation against our business. Mm. And, and, and that's, that's difficult to hear. Because sure. these are these are good men and women, and these are families that struggle. So we have to charge a small fee for our workshops, plus uh, travel expenses. And uh, because of COVID, and also because there's now a thousand organizations out there that are <laughs> training, uh, FBHA has really unfortunately not been able to uh, get that funding because it, it cost us twenty to twenty five thousand dollars to put those that weekend retreat for family survivors from across the country to come mm -hmm. and bond and let them know that hey you're not alone and that's mm -hmm. the important aspect and and I tell you Conrad these are some of the bravest people I've ever met in my life they open up their hearts to others as well as new families that lost uh, a recently a, a fire or EMS or dispatcher and. Uh, their courage and bravery and open, like I said, opening up their hearts to others is just truly amazing. Mm -hmm. How can we, and I say we, I mean, I'm, I'm not a first responder, but I'm talking about the first responder community. How can the first responder community help prevent suicide? What are some of the steps that need to happen? What are some of the, the signs and the things that people can do to perhaps help someone that's uh, on the verge? Well, you know, that's a, it's a great question, and yet it seems simplistic, but it's, it's very, very difficult. Uh, with all my travels and talking to thousands and thousands of our brothers and sisters and losing many that I've known over these years, I'm a firm believer there's only one way that suicide can be prevented, and that is if the person who's struggling asks for the help and, and sticks to it. Now, we can't people in straitjackets and tie them up and keep them in rooms. They, they mm -hmm. have to have that internal need to get that help. And unfortunately, we are such damn good actors, you know, mm -hmm. that when we're struggling, no one really knows. And, and so when we start looking and, and telling people what to look for, and we have our top five warning signs. I interviewed over 500 of our brothers and sisters that were struggling with suicidal ideations and depression, things like recklessness and impulsive uh, anger. Anger is a big one. Uh, isolation, mm -hmm. um, loss of confidence 
and in their skills and abilities. And where this comes into play, and I'm starting to see more and more of it. Why? Because many of our brothers and sisters are standing up and saying, I need help. And so they go to counseling or they go to inpatient treatments and everyone's, oh, thank, thank you. Oh, man, you're a great job. Uh, we, you know, we're proud of you. You stood up and, and you're getting the help. And then they come back from a 30 or 45 day and all of a sudden they're saying, oh, wait, you're, you're coming back to our shift? You know, and, mm-hmm. and they kind of, it brings that loss of confidence. Wait, you, you don't want me now? I just went and got help. I feel a lot better. And, and so we have to really learn that we have to accept people for who they are. They went and got that help. They're, they're healthy now. And, and we need to accept them for that and be proud of them and stand by them, walk the walk with them. And we, mm-hmm. we, so we started seeing that. And then the last issue, the top five warning signs was sleep deprivation. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's a whole workshop in itself. And, you know, sure. that's, that's where I was struggling with for the last 30 years was sleep deprivation. And so, I mean, yes, there's there's many more. There, but when we look at the top five known reasons for fire and EMS killing themselves, unknown is number one. When I talk to the chiefs or the family members, they, they just, uh, we don't know. But the number one known is marital and family relationships by far. And we really have to, you know, work on that piece. That's why it's in our you know, our 12 point plan is to really educate the families how to build those relationships. And and I tell my brothers and sisters, long after you retire and the phone calls start dropping from your friends and brothers and sisters you work with will be your family, whether it's your spouse, your partner, your children, they will be the ones. So build those relationships, work on them right now. Because we know divorce rates are in the mid 60s for first responders. So and we now know that, you know, it's starting to play a role in why we're taking our lives. Mm -hmm. The number two is depression. Number three is uh, diagnosed PTSD. Number four is addictions. And number five is uh, mental health or physical health issues. And and there's Mm -hmm. others. There's legal and there's financial. But. We just completed both FBHA and the city of Las Vegas Fire Department. We just completed a national survey on on moral injury. And we are about to write a white paper on moral injury. And and I believe moral injury will play a larger role than PTSD. Hmm. So moral injury. I've been hearing that phrase more and more in the people I've I've been talking to. Yes. And so. I was I knew about it being a licensed counselor myself, but uh, two uh, firefighters, uh, Eric and Levi, here in the city of Las Vegas, called me to the station. Said, "Jeff, can you watch this video from a doctor? He talks about moral injury for first responders." And, and I truly understood what the doctor was saying, so I started really looking into moral injury and, and understand it's a military term. It was a military mm-hmm. term, just like PTSD was in 2010. And I, I, I talked to three main experts across the United States on moral injury, one who created a, a survey, a national survey, and he sent it to me. And that was what we used for the moral injury for the first responders. We added some of our demographic questions onto it, but we didn't change the, the face of the questions and the values of the questions. And so moral injury in its basic premise is, is that we are born as human beings to want to help others to do good. You get into the first responder world, and now you're trained to save lives. Well, over time, more and more death, you see it, and and you start feeling those emotions of shame, embarrassment, failure, guilt. And one other aspect is betrayal. So where betrayal Mm -hmm. becomes a real role for me in moral injury is that adrenaline is a major rush in our world. And so our bodies get used to that. They look for that adrenaline. Well, how I tie all this in is that maybe for those that have relationships, partners, marriage, after 10, 7, 10, 15 years, things get a little stale. Well, now I'm out at the, having a drink somewhere and, and there's a redhead down at the end of the bar. I start talking to her and maybe we have an emotional affair, or a physical affair, and then all of a sudden our partner or our spouse finds out and they want to divorce us. And it's like, oh, wait, you want to leave us? And then there's that that betrayal, that betrayal either by our spouse or partner who said, hey, till death do us part, or betrayal on my role because I betrayed my partner and my children. 
And so that becomes a major issue. And I tie all this in together because I looked once again at the number one known reason why we are killing ourselves, and that's marital and family relationships. So I think moral injury plays a very large role or betrayal by management. What do you mean I have to work more overtime? What do you mean we can't mm -hmm. get more hirees? There's forced hires. Now I can't see my family as much. So all these things play a role. And the issue is, is that moral injury is not in the diagnostic statistics manual that counselors use to diagnose and treat. So because it's an emotional impact where a lot of his uh, behavior health is, is mental health issues. And so we have a lot of counselors that aren't really relating to moral injury and they're thinking it's PTSD because the experts tell me you can have PTSD and moral injury at the same time. And, I, and so I started looking and I asked them questions. When you looked at your suicide data for the military, what was the highest correlation? And they said the highest correlation to suicide is related to moral injury and not PTSD. So I looked at my data and I found that I have at least 40 of our brothers and sisters who went in for either PTSD or long-term uh, treatment centers, 30, 45 days. When they came back out, they still ended up killing themselves. And it just mm -hmm. makes me wonder, is it because they were being diagnosed for their PTSD or depression, but overlooking the moral injury? So we're doing this national survey to bring a lot more attention to it, especially in the arena of how can we train our counselors and chaplains to look for moral injury as a possible issue. So, mm -hmm. so that's so a little uh, moral injury. So I've talked to people who've helped treat PTSD. How do you work in the moral injury? How, how do you help solve that riddle? Well, that, that's where I would have to then go into the experts of, you know, I'm being a licensed counselor and we didn't really talk about moral injury, but moral injury we, on our committee is one of the uh, authorities. He's a chaplain out of uh, Rush Memorial, a, a military chaplain, and he runs the moral injury department at Rush Memorial in Chicago. And so we will be leaning on him for these are the things that they use to help treat mm -hmm. moral injury. So uh, watch, watch for that white paper to come out in the near future. Awesome. So when do you think that'll come out? I'm hoping that we can start working on it here within the next couple of weeks and that we'll have it out uh, sometime in July. Mm -hmm. So these are challenges that I think every agency faces. Uh, in, in your kind of look at the, the, at the national data, can you estimate how many firefighters – first responders do you think have had some kind of issue in along this this line whether it's PTSD or moral moral injury or you know how many have been affected by the things that they've seen and heard that, that would be nothing but a guess uh, you know an estimated guess but based on you know when you talk on my traveling over three quarters of a million miles over the last 10 years and the thousands and thousands talking to families tracking the data, I would estimate a combination of either PTSD and moral injury or moral injury. I, I would say somewhere up in the 70% plus. Mm -hmm. That's, because you know, it, it's really, it, 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 well, it affects everyone. It affects sure. not only career, it affects the, the volunteers and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all those, uh, you know, I started as a volunteer and I know it's difficult. The people that you work on are, your neighbors and people you see mm -hmm. in your town. Mm -hmm. And when you can't save one of the maybe most popular uh, people of that town and your people know you're on that call and maybe you're walking down the street and someone looks at you differently, maybe because the sun's in their eyes, you start questioning mm -hmm. that they think I did my best to try to save that person. Mm -hmm. And see, all those things are, are moral injuries and maybe mm -hmm. not PTSD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, several years ago, I was working on a project locally here, and, and, and by the way, I live in Emmitsburg, and oh, so very nice. uh, so I was working with our local fire fire department, who's all volunteer f for the most part, and I think now they have some full time uh, you know, EMTs there. But I was talking to a gentleman, I was interviewing him, and he's talked about how one day there was a call, there was a bad accident, and all of a sudden the battalion chief or someone said, uh, "You need to stay back." 
you don't need to go respond to this call. And he goes, well, what, what, what's the deal? Well, it ended up being two of his nieces. And I think one or two, one or both of them were killed in this terrible, terrible crash. And he, he said he went anyway because this was, you know, what he does. And he said, he said, I'm still affected by that. You know, right. so to your point of a volunteer who is responding to a family member, you know, a crisis of a, of a family member. And that has, you know, you don't get away from that, right? Because you're no. at the reunion the next week or the next month and, and there they are missing or there there you relive that experience. Well, and, and that comes to, um, you know, the personal issue. I always thought it was my PTSD. But uh, at 22 months uh, old, my granddaughter uh, lost her right eye to cancer, retinoblastoma. And I, I felt I always had to be strong, you know, for my eye mm. because I was the, the husband, the father, the grandfather, the battalion chief, the licensed counselor, founder of FBHA. And I began to isolate uh, very mm. quickly. And I didn't ever want to hear the word cancer. It was just, it's something. Uh, but when I heard my daughter scream and cry when they took her in for the surgery, I had that feeling, I'm supposed to do something. You know, this is my mm. granddaughter. I'm supposed to do something to save that right eye. And for the longest time, I always thought that was PTSD, but now understanding moral injury, I, I think it was more of that, that moral injury that affected me, caused me to isolate and have those feelings because I was trained. I was trained to save lives. I was trained to do something to, to help. And, and here's my granddaughter, and there wasn't one thing I could do to save that right eye. And, and I felt guilt and uh, you know, a, a shame that you know, people are, hey, dad, you know, what, what can we do to help you know, Lily? And it's like, I couldn't do one thing. My hands were mm -hmm. tied. And so I think I was struggling more from moral injury than PTSD. Hmm. Do you think there's a difference between, say, uh, a, a, an all professionally staffed fire station, firehouse, and and the one that has more volunteers. Do you think there's a difference in how uh, those two different types of agencies respond to traumatic events, and or how what the what what, what the help is available for those? I think uh, there is the possibility it could be a big difference uh, because w with career. You could go back and, and talk to your brothers and sisters. Uh, there was EAP programs. You had peer support te system teams. And so you were there, though, to talk where, like I said, I started as a volunteer. And when at two in the morning, when you're walking through the cornfields looking for bodies that were ejected out of a car, and three hours later, you had to be at your job. Hmm. Boy, those, those things, they, they sat on your mind. And there was just there's, like I said, there's so many volunteer departments out there. They don't have counselors in their towns. Uh, you know, they didn't have telehealth and things like this. So you had to rely maybe on a chaplain if there happened to be one in the town. Otherwise, hey, it, it, was, it was all yours to, to, to carry. And so, yeah, I, they're both very difficult to handle because of the multiple numbers of trauma that career can possibly see. Uh, compared to a volunteer, but the volunteer organizations now, um, they're, they're, they're flying solo on so many of those aspects. So that's why it's so important that we see, uh, like the National Volunteer Fire Council, who is really pushing behavioral health for the volunteer fire departments, and you're seeing those responses now. You're seeing, you know, there's a national directory of counselors. The National Volunteer Fire Council uh, asked FBHA to put together a national directory of counselors, and that can be found on our webpage. So that, and they're in every state. We have counselors in every state. We have well over 300 on this list. And now a, a volunteer firefighter or EMS or even dispatcher can sit in the comfort of their home and talk to a counselor who has been vetted that works with first responders. They might be across the state. But those, those things, those resources are there for them. And that's why I say it's so important when you start creating a behavioral health program to include all the resources you possibly can for your people. Because EMDR doesn't work for everyone. Brain mapping doesn't work for everyone. CBT, uh, horse therapy doesn't work for everyone. You have to have different types of resources for your personnel. And so, the, like I said, the good thing is, is we're talking about it amongst the volunteer, the career, the military, the wildland, EMS, dispatchers, and we're finding those resources for our people. The key, though, is to make sure that 
every organization is doing it. And unfortunately, there's still many pockets out there that don't, uh, well, it didn't happen to us. We haven't been affected by anything yet. And, and so they're becoming more the reactive instead of proactive. And, and I mm-hmm. just plead with them, please look into it, find the resources. Mm-hmm. I think that is so important. I think with the volunteers as well, from from my outsider perspective, I can see that, you know, if you are affected by something and you start to isolate, you don't just show you don't show up for calls. You know, because you're a volunteer, you don't necessarily have to unless you're maybe perhaps one of the command staff, Uh, you know, so you can isolate even more and your brothers and sisters don't see what's going on because you're not showing up. You know, Conrad, that is such an excellent point because we've seen that in our data. Um, We had a a volunteer EMS, uh, firefighter EMS, and she was... She was attending like 98% of all the trainings, uh, 90% of all the calls. And then uh, her mother moved in with her and was dying of cancer. So she started taking care of her and it was, it was rough on her. And then when her mother mm-hmm. passed away, it's exactly what you said. And she, she didn't, she didn't go to her children's uh, functions at school. She didn't barely tr- uh, attend any training and didn't show up for calls. And eventually her depression got the worst of her that she ended up taking her life and talking to the mm-hmm. chief of validating. He said, man, he said, I, I think back now and, and, and I feel guilty because I, I could see by the numbers she wasn't showing up. I just wish we would have been a little bit more proactive to say, hey, how can we help you? You know, I, we, mm-hmm. we kind of, you know, know that you were handling with your mom and then she passed away. and We thought we'd give you some space. He said, you know, it was absolutely the wrong thing to do at, at that time. At least Mm -hmm. extend a hand and ask. And if they say no, then they say no. But, um, you know, like I said, that's it's a great point, especially in the volunteers when they're starting to isolate because they're not showing up. Uh, That's something where, you know, we always had these two themes, and that was be direct and challenge with compassion. When you see something in your brothers and sisters, be direct, challenge with compassion. We added a third one called doing an internal size up. And what that means is we, as first responders, all of us need to ask ourselves on a daily basis, why am I acting this way? Why am I feeling this way? And the best thing that we can do is listen to others because they see us so much better than we will ever see ourselves. And so if we can start doing these little things to help us and to make sure that we take care of our our self-care by exercising, journaling, writing, walking, whatever it is to make sure that we take care of our minds and our bodies at the same time and learn to put pride to the side and ask for help. Hmm. How important is it to, if someone that you know you're working with, a colleague, uh, a brother or sister in the fire service, and they start showing some of those signs of suicidal ideation, how important is it just to be direct and to to talk about that with them? It's absolutely direct. Uh, It's, it's needed. It has to be direct and say, hey, you know, and use I statements. I, I've seen you, you. You've changed. I've seen different things happen. <clears throat> Is there something going on in your life? I, I'm here to listen. And you have to be direct by saying, are you thinking of killing yourself? <clears throat> it's, it's a tough question to ask. It's not hurting. Hurting means I run into that wall five times. There's a big difference. Mm. And most people are afraid to ask that question. One is that because they're afraid that the answer is, yes, I, I've been thinking about it, and they don't know what to say. And, mm. Or the other one is, geez, I, I hadn't been thinking about it. Do you think I should? And so they, they don't know what that response is. And it's it's very easy to say, man, I'm, I'm sorry. Let me walk the walk. Let me help you find some help. Just be compassionate. And you know those things, just learning how to listen is so critical. And you need to ask them another question is, that, do you have a plan? Because having a plan tells you that they've thought this through. They've seen how it ends. And that's important to know. So two questions we are always say, hey, do you think, are you thinking of killing yourself? And do you have a plan? And those are important conversation starters for people because they might not be seeing that they're actually showing isolation or showing depression. And so just, oh, you're feeling okay? Okay, great. Uh, Those days are long gone, and we need to be proactive for our brothers and sisters. 
So if the answer is yes to both of those questions, what's my next step? Well, next question, the next step is say, hey, let's find you right now. And you can't leave them alone. You can't. I mean, if they say, well, I've had a thought or two, and the last one was like three weeks ago, that's different than thinking, yeah, you know, I've been thinking about killing myself late, last night or yesterday. That's where mm-hmm. you, you can't leave them alone. And you, you have to look within your organization. Do we have the steps? Do we have the resources? And if you don't, then find them. Take them to the hospital. You know, walk that walk with them. These are all the things that we teach in our workshop is, you know, what to do, what to look for. How do we get them to the hospital if they come to an officer? You know, is it, is it HIPAA issue if we have to call your family? No, it's not because you're not rendering treatment there. You're just looking to help them and let your family know that hey, you might be gone for three days for a psychological evaluation. But have all this prearranged with the hospital. Can we walk in through the back door? Uh, mm-hmm. If you're on duty, can we have that person change clothes to civilians? Of course, you can't leave them alone. But all mm-hmm. these things are, we cannot be afraid to, to challenge ourselves and say, wow, man, I don't know how to handle this. Guess what? You probably do. You probably mm-hmm. do. It's just it's new territory for so many people because we don't ask people these questions. Mm-hmm. And so questions, no resources. Find those resources. Don't leave them alone. Find the uh, a counselor or a hospital that, that you can take them into is absolutely vital. Hmm. What can I do if my friend is isolating and they're not responding to my text messages or not responding to a phone call, you know, goes right to voicemail? What can I what should I do in, in that case? You know, that's a great question. I had a uh, peer support team member call me up and said, Jeff, you know, this uh, person's been calling off sick. And uh, I I tried to text him this morning um, and just nothing. He said, I have an appointment to see him uh, tonight at six. And I asked, I said, are you available right now? It was like 10 in the morning. I said, are you free now? He said, yeah. I said, said, go over there now. Go over there right now and say, hey, you know what? I I was in the area. I just wanted to stop in, see how you're doing. Uh, you know, you, you seem like uh, you, you need someone to talk to. And, and I'm here. I'm here to listen. And many people at times will say, well, you know, I'm just not ready to talk and things or, you know, I don't have a problem. And so my return response is always, OK, if you don't have a problem, please know that, you know, I'm, I'm here if you ever need to listen. But I also want you to know that there are times I need someone to talk to. Would it be OK if I called you? and open up my heart to, to you on some issues that I've been dealing with, this breaks down the barrier, saying, wow, if they're, if they're willing to open up their heart to me, maybe I can, it's okay to open up a little bit to them. It might not happen instantaneously, and it doesn't, because I, I get calls all the time, say, Jeff, I, I tried that, and they called me three or four days later and said, hey, I'm willing to talk, and uh, yes, I'll be there for you as well. So just like I said, being proactive in these challenging with compassion, those moments, you might not capture them right then, but you might capture them a couple of days later. Mm-hmm. So what if I'm in a part of an agency and there's not a big focus on mental health and wellness? How can I begin to change the, the focus or the culture in my agency to, to make a difference there? Well, I think one of the first things you... Uh, you is to contact your chief officer or your boss and say, hey, you know what, I've been really interested. As you know, there's a big uh, push out there in in our culture for behavioral health, and I would like to take some classes. I would like to bring some type of behavioral health uh, chief or whoever it is. I'd like, uh, you know, so your permission and your backing that it's okay that I start looking into behavioral health. And uh, if they say no, then there's a problem and uh, you would have to maybe contact a, a nearby department and say, hey, I'd like to be a member of your peer support team or SISM team so that I can learn something from you and respond so that I can bring it back to our department and then start working it through the the fire or an EMS organization member say, hey, you know what? Uh, we need something for ourselves. We need to have resources and go out into the community and, and contact counselors and see if they'll be a resource for you if if you're talking to one of your members and they say, well, I, I really need to see someone. Hey, great. I, I just vetted last three, the last couple of weeks, I just vetted two counselors in our community that work with first responders. Here's their name and, and, and their number. You, know, you, you just, we can't give up on this. 
And uh, like I said, there are pockets across America that still they don't have that buy-in belief from up, uh, you know, the upper echelon of the organization to, you know, really move quickly on behavioral health. And it doesn't take a lot of money, not at all. This is legwork. This is phone calls. This is vetting. And we have, I, I get a lot of calls from first responders and because I have the national directory, but before that, I, I used to call two, three counselors in an area and I have 12 questions I would vet counselors with through a conversation. If anyone on your program here wants those questions or they want any of our uh, templates on behavioral health, how to create peer support teams, just have them email me at jdill at ffbha.org. Go to our website, email me. I'll send you our templates. It does me no good to hoard all this information. I, I send that out for free. You know, it gives you a baseline of uh, what what steps you need to do to take care of your brothers and sisters, find those resources. Hmm. That's great. We can put the link to your website on in the show notes and in the comments for, okay. for this great. program. So Jeff, what is, what are some of the big things you're working on next? I know you're working on this white paper and what do you, what, what's the future for first responders, for firefighters, for in, in this area of, of wellness? I am, um, you know, that's a great question because it's moved so rapidly, so quickly in 12 years. Uh, I think I would like to see a common training because if you're a chief out in the middle of Nebraska and you say, man, I'd like some behavior health training, you go on the internet and there's just, like I said, a thousand organizations. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see some type of common training that everyone has agreed to. And yes, I know a lot of Eagles would be involved in trying to put together <laughs> some type of national program of training, but I'd like to see that training in the fire academies, EMS academies, the dispatch academies. I'd like to see officers have a baseline training that was a commonality training on how to talk to your people, how to find resources, how to create behavioral health programs. I would like to see every organization have a complete behavior health organization. So those are the things that uh, you know are on my wish list that I work together, and that's why we called an alliance way back when. You know, in, in 2010, we thought we we would all work together. Unfortunately, that that didn't happen. And uh, yes, we work with a lot of different organizations. We work with NAMI and the NVFC and, and different organizations, but um, it, it has to be more that. Uh, something that's in common because what makes us different from any other organization is not only that uh, we track the data and validate the data, but 90% of our seven workshops that we offer come from our brothers and sisters. It's not things that we pulled off the internet. It comes from their experiences, their the lessons they've learned, the lessons we've learned, me being in the fire service, me being a licensed counselor, that's where ours makes a, is different than any other organizations. So uh, you won't find a lot of stuff. And, uh, we talk about the DSM-5, so we, we talk about that in our workshops. But you won't find things that come off the Internet uh, in our workshops. And, and I think that's important. I think that we need to uh, have some, some type of training that is relatable to our brothers and sisters. Hmm. Well, so the final word here, what, what should, what, what's a first step someone could take for themselves if they recognize in themselves that they are dealing with some of these issues and, and they probably need to talk some, what's the first step someone should do? First step is to reach out to your support system, whether it's your family members, whether it's your, your crew at the station, your chaplain, reach out and say, you know what, it, it's time for me to seek help. And they can always call FBHA. Uh, we we do that for free. We direct them to counselors that have been vetted. But it, it's like I said, it's important that they put pride to the side and reach out to their support system. Reach out to uh, an officer within their department or a firefighter within that department and say, I, it's, it's time. I need some help. And we are at our strongest when we extend our hand and say, I need some help. And uh I know of no brother or sister in these past 12 years that has ever turned anyone down and say, no, nah, I don't have time for that. They're there to walk the walk with them. So please put that pride to the side, 
reach out, you know, and somebody well, somebody said, well, do it for your family. Yes, that's important. But you know what? Do it for yourself because I want you to have a great career, but I want you to have a better retirement. The fire mm-hmm. service, the EMS, the dispatch does not define who you are. And that is something that we always have to remember. We are own our each individual intellect, emotions, and it does not define by the job that we do. So please reach out, ask for help. Hmm. So finally, coming up this week is, is an event coming up. Tell us about that and how people can get involved with that. Yes, uh, May 20th. It's the uh, third Friday. It's been that way for uh, seven years. This will be our eighth annual We Remember Night. We ask that fire EMS organizations, you, know, you have rigs, pull them out onto the apron, run your lights at 2100 hours to say we remember our fallen brothers and sisters who died by suicide. Take some videos, take some pictures, send them to us at uh, info at ffbha.org. Uh, my wife puts them all together into a, uh, like a photage type of thing. And uh, for dispatchers, uh, you can step outside and light, or even inside, light a candle saying we remember our fallen brothers and sisters. It's not only them that we remember, but it's also the family members that have lost someone. So it's, uh, like I said, it's our eighth annual. It's a nationwide event. And uh, we hope that uh, organizations uh, that are listening to this podcast will join us. Uh, we, we have our small towns all the way up to large cities like Denver and uh, Seattle, San Diego, all the way up to small organizations up in the Yukon that have joined us up in Canada. So it's, uh, it's important because suicide, there's no discrimination. It doesn't matter if it's fire EMS, it doesn't matter dispatch, if it's career volunteer, city, suburban, rural, there's no discrimination. So please uh, join us May 20th, 2100 hours, your local time, and uh, run your rigs for one minute with the lights, take some videos. And if you had someone that you lost, you might want to contact their family and say, would you like to come down and stand by the rig and hold a candle to remember your loved one? So. And that's this coming Friday night, um, May 20th. So join us there. And if you're watching this after May 20th, uh, it'll come again next year. And But uh, there's, there's always ways to remember those who who have been lost because of suicide. Absolutely. Uh, on our webpage, we have a hall of memories. It's uh, very touching. Family members that have sent in pictures of their loved ones. And uh, if you've lost a fire or EMS, uh, please send us a picture. My wife will include them into the hall of memories. And it's it's very touching. It's, it's very moving to watch that uh, with the music and things. So. Very good. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for for taking time out of your busy schedule to be on the program today. I really appreciate that. Appreciate the work you're doing and the lives you're saving by the work you're doing. So thank you so much. Conrad, once again, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm honored uh, that you would take the time out to interview me and and have me on your show to talk about the issue that will not go away, uh, away. So we do absolutely have to be very proactive in the behavioral health for our first responders. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Jeff, for being with us today, for participating in the PTSD 911 Presents podcast. I really appreciate your insight and the work that you're doing is important. So keep on doing this work and be sure to join us next time for another program. We have some amazing interviews that we have recorded and are preparing for you for this program. So be sure to check back with us again. If you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button, click on the little bell. So you're notified when we're getting ready to, uh, to put to publish something and uh we'd love it if you would join with us and help us to get to the finishing uh of our film so ptsd 911 documentary is currently in production we are raising about fifteen thousand dollars in order to get the film finished as far as the production side so that we can go into post-production There's a link in the show notes and the comments below where you can make a contribution. We've raised about $575 already out of a $15,000 fundraiser. So if you can help us out with that and give some money toward us, toward us getting this film project done, we'd greatly appreciate it. Also, this program that you're watching today is completely free and we don't get paid for this at all. So if you want to help support this project and the film, 
please make a contribution. We'd greatly appreciate it. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you again soon. Again, my name is Conrad Weaver. Be sure to subscribe, and I'll talk to you again soon. Take care.